Ravings from the lucid fringe. Ravings from the lucid fringe. Musings from an unposterized life. Improvised on the front line of love and beauty. Welcome, I'm Semerick Yarrow. This week on Ravings from the Lucid Fringe, episode 15. English boyhood memories. Most of these poems come from... Flying on the Lucid Fringe, my 2009 book, and haven't been recorded before. Some of them aren't even in print yet, but will be going up at my Substack site. A little journey through my biography. New Catton, 1977. It was 1977, and the local community centre held a jumble sale in time for the Queen's Jubilee. I coasted across Lewis's bedroom floor as we discovered a city under the sea. Even school had a day not just for purple things or yellow things, but for things red, white and blue. My matchbox plastic car track had to do. But at home the colours of fruit and flowers burst through. Young people trooped in to find the peace of meditation, while we played with one's old van stored in our shed. Garden parties with donkeys and the punch and judy man. Holidays to butlins where the attendants all wore red. I was roused from my sick bed to watch Star Wars, aged five. Dreams of rooms closing in with swamp monsters followed me, mixed with Scooby-Doo nightmares from our black and white TV after lentils with liver and rissoles for tea. All I wanted was to be a cowboy with a pop gun, so I cried when I was made an Indian brave through a doorway from which coloured plastic strips were draped, Justin's mum appeared and offered alphabet pasta shapes. If these memories miss the hymns from school, the summer paddles in the park, or Anne's nappy-smelly house of fun, or fireworks after dark, somewhere... There's a boy who's Batman, still thinking up crazy games, still tasting Granny's gingerbread, still small enough for the shrubbery to be a hidden jungle full of stone goblins, still small enough for the garden to be an unruly empire, still unwrapped and waiting for the seventies to end. I shall swing him upside down now, and laugh with the freedom of my own age. Government Milk and Bigger Things, 1978 I slept and walked the toilet route in my thin red pyjamas, except that this was a holiday chalet, and the loo of my dreams was my parents' bed. In day's bright light, the best thing was a length of the pool in armbands and the fortress of triangular couch cushions. We left the camp each day for grand Welsh castles and ruined stones of last Welsh stands and a grinding funicular that took us for summit tea on Snowdon while I envied Dad his solo climb to meet us. School had begun in all its glory, state milk with a straw, plastic named trays of books, gold stars and wild stories unfurled, rubber plimsolls for movement to a taped sound journey, 
through stalactites and stalagmites, and there my body remembered the eerie walkways of a summer cave. Deep in my inner life emerged a favourite playground tale of being stuck but safe in a wrap of cartoon glue and of melted chocolate tunnels until Leroy's head cracked open on a real wall. These were the days of eight children to a dining table, two played parents to help serve semolina and swede and bony fish and sometimes pink custard. My table's father had sucked his thumb flat. Even at six the irony was not lost on me, but as I bounded away on my new space hopper I took on more demanding challenges. Brushing teeth alone on my first sleepover, after Bambi on a home projector. Conquering chickenpox with my brother, and I marvelled at the world, and its duck-billed platypuses, and its Romans whose British roads were so rudely straight that a boy could still ride on them atop his real father's shoulders, and know he was a much-beloved God. Seven, neath the Severn, 1979. On holiday, climbing rocks that oozed magic for a seven years boy, I turned and gazed over the boggy Devon moor and thought of Merlin, craggy tin tagel fog where Arthur was replaced by sheep droppings, except on TV each week before the Dukes of Hazard, An old cottage in Camelford, a place with no camels or llamas but puddles and bad roads, arriving cold but rescued by the AA van, another day and sunshine on the turquoise sea, demanding Cornish ice cream on Penzance Beach, whose coves were carved so curvaceously different from Norfolk's flinty shores, crossing the causeway to Michael's Mount with angels and warriors and fantastic Mr. Fox mingling in my storytelling mind that built Lego castles and crossed plastic drawbridges and bought and loved a second-hand bear called White Softy, better than all the rest better than Tracy, who I wooed with complex homemade cards and sipped fizzy drinks with on my birthday, alone together in Wimpy, save for Mum and Dad, better than Helena of the tomboy bob and tartan skirt, three doors away in a house you could get lost in, where long-range string phones meant something, better than Grumpy Tuller, a feline as untouchable as the pears on our tree were inedible, until cooked slowly in sugar. I knew little of what the world deemed vital, but that Jim Callahan's face was a friendlier one to vote for, as I told a bemused mother and a doorstep canvasser. And then the seventies did end. Not with my Rupert record and Lieutenant Kije and Elvis, even then my least favourite LP, but with a first New Year Midnight, brought in with that box again featuring Kenny Everett and the hilarity of false boobs. Thus began the 80s. Boyhood's Heart, 1981 with baggy madness trousers on the stereo, we prepared the middle school stage, felt the thrill of orchestral satisfaction, little drummer boy, on a music stand page. Crowning of a year begun with loving, raucous fun from Mr. Spinks, who labelled my trombone case a coffin, who hung Ricky from the rafters, and stood Daniel on a chair to perform his Donald Duck voice while the class laughed and stared. Daniel, who blew gum bubbles and hung fishing nets in rivers, and told me my first dirty joke one night, but 
I found a forest of books about boats on the broads and boys and witches' cats. We all left the city for a boys' brigade camp, a sleeping bag and a lilo and a martial blue hat, and James's strip show for the girls to the vicar's surprise, and the boredom of cancelled outings while Charles married Di, and disbelief at Noah's age, and porridge with a fork, and whoopee cushions, and sneezing powder, and just once going to church to earn points, and the ninth birthday present of learning meditation, and the freedom and the stillness of the patterns in my mind. Rode to an island in a Yugoslav lake, ate soft veal and bought a real souvenir, spent a day in Italy, astonished at the lira's value, drove too fast in an Austrian's Mercedes-Benz, passed tall fields of corn to a village museum of ancient simple peasant houses, saw indulgent riverside chateaux and huge chess pieces in a cloggenfoot park, climbed the whole day up a white stone path to a ledge over the scree and even into Yugoslavia again, somewhere below the fog. Perhaps I pondered questions of nations and history, but Botham's cricket victories impressed me more, along with Peggy's rounders hits and my balancing on a bike, or a quarter pound of sherbet lemons after school, or the red mini metro that shaped my cake, or the pebbles that were Sheringham's beach, or Pete's dragon in three reels on the school projector, or mum frying flat, door-delivered Friday fish. Double figures, 1982. Sleeping in a caravan in empty Walcott, Marum grass dunes and sea swim, and seals, buried alive by mistake while mum read her novel, oblivious to the frantic digging of brother and father. I lay in peace and pride, knowing we'd dug six feet deep and struck water on our personal public beach. An ancient cat, more than twice my age, a friend made and never seen again, an intrepid family exploring our own county, mud flats on the north coast, and the cheap thrills of Hun Stanton's helter skelter doormats, while sea worms crawled across the wrong way shore. Other boys drew bombs and gathered photos of the great Union Jack battles in the South Atlantic. We made houses from thick foam mattresses levitated on weekly by the new flyers, and I played badminton and asteroids by night, sang Psalm 23 in a choir for the pensioners, played the Muppet theme and Mussorgsky in a Victorian bandstand, while Spurs won the cup again in the rain. I collected stamps and dinosaur names, saw London for the first time, passed the Oval, and St. Paul's Dome on double-deckers, returned home to the joys of friends and bicycles, until Mrs. Hopkins, stand-in teacher for far too long, praised my every move and every stitch on my bean-bag frog, leaving me exposed in all my glory and seeking a safe hole to hide in. What stands out most pungently from 1982? the sweet, forbidden taste of pig's bladder bought by Philip's ageing parents, vomiting all through Christmas week's tinsel and TV, oral school French in a Norfolk accent, Killage too, breakdancing school discos and the regular failure of phantom neighbouring school fighters to appear there, Rubik's Cubes, and Poo Sticks above the glorious swans in Cherry Hinton Park. 
Simon crashing through his corrugated shed below our treehouse, exploring his mystery Anderson shelter and the dip beneath our plane tree. Pink, snow-filled skies and sledging on the heath, grand cricket tournaments planned but never realised, summer play scheme museum trips, life growing ever wider. Superheroes are always at war, 1983. An old Soviet leader died the day I punched Milsey and punched again and cried in the classroom while rain poured outside and the boys' bogs stank of bleach and gobbing contests. And I felt the slicing edge of fashion and learnt to cringe at my jumble sale flares and homespun hairdo. Jobs, not bombs, lost that year to the Union Jack fascists. Boys wrote stories mocking their peers for oversized ears and on a day that the fat ones, chip shop owning, always eating parents bothered to send him to school, he sat on me and stank. Though not as badly as poor stupid Shirley who had fleas, they claimed. The only fleas I thought I saw were at a circus. At my little brother's school fate, where I found magic once more, in a singing man and a tarot reader who eased exam nerves. Days after, I crossed Norwich cobbles to play piano once more, before evening wind ensembles and a kinder kind of child. Found magic, too, in a book of English rituals nobody remembered. Simonal cake and mischief night and over-shoulder apple peels. I gazed wistfully in passing Parker's peace, where in his childhood days Dad waged battle with a bat. I was driven on to a first holiday camp alone, a lawn which hid a wartime maze, and in the grounds we captured generals and field marshals and shouted orders in a grand game of combat organised by our young supervisors, one of whom I stared at when I could, for she wore no bra. And I tussled with kids from grimier cities than my own, had fun at times, but met no bookish kindred spirits. I did not particularly seek the success I showed in prime numbers on primitive computers, but I devoured Marvel comics lent me by a man who noticed more of me, it seemed, than a father locked, that year I turned eleven, in verbal combat with my mother behind the kitchen door. I turned life into a soap opera I was directing. It had the same theme tune as Dallas. With a light hand on my heart, I burnt matches at the rubbish dump with Philip and threw jar after jar, revelling in the power we had to shatter glass. Private Uniformity, 1984 Lower stoffed fish heads on a harbour outing, hundredweights of ice in the factory. I won 8p in a one-armed bandit, and Leroy scored with Donna back at school that day, or so the rumour went. A sheep skull in a stream near Keswick, gullible Gary eating a pasty full of droppings, remembered in the morning of a deep-fried toast. Nicky, mooning to impress, but I preferred the contour sculpture in the hostel lounge, the clean smell of pine, the sight of a last red squirrel, the feel of mountain heather to all the crudities of twelve-year-olds. At home, divorce spilled tar-like from parents darkly sore. I escaped the playground names in summer, presided over a birthday of boys and magenta sabre-wolf screens on my ZX spectrum. Then father and son sought out family roots found them in the hills of Selkirkshire, in the brooks and rocks of a softer Scotland, in the juice I chilled in a stream, in the fire of Edinburgh's theatrical streets. 
Turned south to Durham's Grand Cobbles, first seven-inch singles and Macbeth the comic. Back in Norwich, refreshed and prepared, I donned the uniform of a new school and, at last, the uniform of the eighties. Learnt to tie a tie the right way, and quickly, too, the wrong way. Sat on cross-city buses with friends and foes. Fragile first-day tears and a bittersweet first-day smell that I recalled for years after in the corridors. And found a friend in David, sound and knowing. Gel in my hair, I agadoo danced in a fake leather tie. Built up another hero in my Schubertian piano teacher. Practiced scales with dedication until my veins bulged blue. Collected great composers in a private rush to wisdom. Forgot, at times, the strife oozing from my home. Teenage status symbols in shifting sand, 1985. Easter weekend wandering, fair rides in the city, candy floss and an LP in a bag from HMV, and home to find that same day in the same city centre. Roy had dropped down and died. No more idle musings before band practice over prostitutes' condoms in the alley next to Lady Julian's ancient seat of celibacy. No more pondering over what to do if the four-minute warning came. A brief moment of mortality before the teenage herd swept on. By year's end I'd killed off another friendship. David's star knocked off course by a school camp faux pas. A school camp I was not on. And I jumped on board the rumour bus to avoid the same fate. It had been a year of questing for status... And I hadn't had a snog yet, and worse, I'd admitted it. But I'd choplifted reams of junk with friends and tricked old Bumfrey into giving me an A for a woodwork project full of nursery rhymes. Others sought status in the weirdest of ways, accosted by Lacoste and Pringle or trainers with a label. The potent stink of exploding hormones in the changing rooms was at the edge of some unexplained new birth. My mother thought she knew and read more into Christmas cards from girls than I knew to be true. Beyond the everyday thirteen-year-old drama lay performances to lift my soul, after chips in a reefum church, while others watched Live Aid, or a walk-on roll in absurdist sackcloth for my father, whose new house and new life excited me in glimpses, stories of American Indians and peanut butter ice cream. Still watching and bearing the bitching between my mum and her mum over festive chicken in an ex-garage extension, no longer with the energy to race to the much-loved concrete playground nearby. Perhaps the fizzless, giant pink refreshers of his garden path were my grand's misguided husband's attempts at eternity. At home, our old shed became another man's building site, and the sands were shifting faster than any of us could grasp, and all Wells' choices seemed to face me, Snowball or Napoleon, and my nervous answer came, after mediocre music contests in muggy Midland towns, perhaps I should just sit back for some more TV? Uncertain Certainty, 1986 When France danced through Brazil in Mexico, I finally discovered football's majestic side. It was a summer of driving south on long, straight French roads, lazing in tents and listening to cicadas, trapping wasps in an apple juice beaker, eating myrti as we scaled the Pyrenean peaks, while Keelan's horsefly leg swelled with every step. Later, we crossed La Cirque and cut through like Roland to Spain. I leapt across crevices and knew I would not die, but my companions lacked my certainty. 
Mont Perdu remained hidden. Turning fourteen, I awoke soaked in a collapsed tent. Another birthday abroad, seeking shelter and pizza, in narrow cobbled streets with yellow headlights flashing past, but this one without mum. In Perpignan I marvelled at real palm trees, and at Reagan pledging to fight apartheid in South America. Back home, Grandad's ashes were flown over from the Cape. We mourned with his diaspora for a man we hardly knew. His legacy lived on as I soloed with the brass band, triumphant at the championships and rising like certain snakes we flowered, ready to swallow and split from senior band old-timers. My technique flowered too. The dabbling in jazz reached beyond the a cappella Miller moods I'd sung with boys for girls at music courses passed in wartime Nissen huts. The dabbling in love remained bittersweet, locked inside my silent heart. I ached for girls as friends, but never dared hope for more. Instead I found a certainty in veggie peace badge politics, in joyously pompous pop a la queen, in Norwich pubs and too much booze and pool with friends in a new colour TV and a VCR, while our kittens dive-bombed off my bed and shredded the velvet beyond, while Woody chased my bro with an axe, all in jest, while my mother's tears over lovers sent me swearing to the door. I was certain that Maggie was wrong, Mum was wrong, her men were wrong, and that things fall apart. Sharpening My Chrysalid Wings, 1987 Covent Garden Opera House for Tosca at high pitch, an early music O-level, and a flying grade eight, peppered through with Woody Allen witticisms, though at other times I quoted teen movies and guitars. Avignon, so crisp and quiet, gorgeous in the sunset. A school exchange to witness admirably unashamed French girls display their wares and hairs beside the pool, while we hid our awkwardness and watched from behind dark glasses and beer glasses that was strangely legal. A summer of vending machines for packets of cigarettes and condoms. Only one packet got used, and they tasted pretty foul. Still, my room was now a poster-plastered tribute to my inner celebrity. As for real life, it was discussed over tuppenny rugby on the top-floor tables every lunch break with the boys. And on those foreign trips where two girls smiled sweetly, asked what made them pretty, and my soon-to-be-gay friend lost his tongue. My own vanished when another girl declared she wanted me. I still had not kissed with tongues, but I knew she was not the one, so I got secretly smashed on the ferry home and wobbled my way through customs. It seemed that Mum's new man was here to stay. His medieval beard and etchings and his archives of classical cassettes won little respect from me, for his crime was clear. He was not my dad who we'd walked with in the German Alps that fifteenth summer. I found myself briefly grown up enough for alcohol-free beer, and olives at last. Autumn came, and a rebel storm sent once-climbed trees scattering, and my school blazer blazed on the guy, and with one of my more rebellious friends I headed not for Covent Garden but for Sting's fine band at Wembley Arena, and I knew that one day that would be me. Recipe for a New Era, 1988 Saturday night, somewhere in Norwich, aged fifteen and some, Tear open a litre of juice and drink some. Top it up with vodka from a bottle. Throw the bottle in the bin. Drink until the party begins. Repeat with variations at regular intervals for the next four years. French kiss through the fog far too infrequently. 
find a frilly bra outside the private girls' high school. Watch with delight as it remains for a week, hung on the school sign beside the London road, advertising to commuters the delights within. Sit in school gyms and pass exams easily, sometimes with a hangover. Pick strawberries for peanuts till your back aches and your nose burns. Tell your mother less and less about your daily life. Let your local friends throw beer cans in your Tory neighbour's garden. Thank your lucky stars that your distant school knows nothing of this. Get yourself locked in a dingy club for the night. Do a little minor graffiti, shoplifting and vandalism. Start to grow your hair. Listen to metal and wear pentacles to be cool, but secretly prefer dire straits. Play jazz at your trombone teacher's wedding and hit the right high notes. Hear the rumours of a drama room mass fight on the last pre-exam school day. Watch the mere sight of the deputy head send the assembled hordes scattering. And after the holidays, a school purged of those who'd left for jobs at Norwich Union, where I could finally declare my love for Shakespeare and love the bloody passion of the French Revolution. Bliss was it that dawn to be alive. So, thank you for listening to this latest episode in the series and you can find all of my articles and my recordings at lucidfringe.substack.com except my music and poetry from the past which is all available at simrickyarrow or one word dot bandcamp dot com and the background recordings and sounds that you will have heard are all either from those recordings or they are my own please do give this a rating if it's on your podcast app please spread the word if you enjoy what you hear and if you want to give me some feedback or commentary of course I'm very open to that any suggestions for future episodes okay enjoy see you next time Ravings from the Lucid Fringe Ravings from the Lucid Fringe Musings from an unpasteurized life Improvised on the front line of